yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Thank you, sis. As always. <sighs> I might as well not say it, honestly. Hello, everyone. How are we doing? Da 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 Completely wiped my mind. Hello everyone, it's infrastructure again. It's infrastructure and colonies, shipyards at Commonwealth and Empire. Hello everyone, how are we all doing? I love my family. I just keep reminding myself of that. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, Carl Gasberg. Hello, Captain C4. Hello, Knight6831. Hello, Bijan. Hello, Sage. Hello, Roland Cash. Hello, Lions. Hello, George Newman. Hello, Info Addict. Hello, N35 Benavids. Hello, Alvazaski. Hello, DGB40. Hello, everyone. How are we all doing today? Ooh. It's a warm place. It's a very warm place where you are, N35 Benavids. Rain on the window. Mm hmm. My evening at the moment is fluffies and fluffies. And I spent mostly the day doing various stuff in the office. Just keep reminding <laughs> Yeah, I do. I do. Um, please, though. Just to clarify at the beginning. My sister has told me now several times she doesn't like interrupting my lives. And I tell her when they're on. And she actually comes up and asks, are you live? And I go, yes. And she still carries on. And then later she tells me I don't like interrupting them. And I'm sort of going, I'm not going to win this argument. I am enough of a naval strategist to know I will never win this argument. You are my sister. You are therefore theoretically an elder female variant of me. And I know I'm never going to win this argument. Because I've got enough cousins, I've had enough experience, enough girlfriends, enough in my life that I know I'm never going to win this argument. So I'm not even starting this argument. But there is still a part of me which is just going, it's so illogical. It's just so illogical. Anyway, it can really throw you at the beginning of, of your uh, life. I don't know. I love them dearly. But next week, I'm away from them for a whole week. So, you know, good times. <laughs> oh. And the office is coming along nicely. I've got one more set of shelves to do. Um, these shelves are now up. The painting I'm mostly happy with, so I'm slowly packing that up. And all the books will be in their bookshelves shortly. There's the bookshelves are done underneath the desk, underneath this behind me. Yeah, it's fun. Rather appropriate for infrastructure to be dealing with all this. Because, honestly, so many... It, it's quite disturbing when you're going through your books and going, um, I think I might be mildly obsessed with infrastructure. Because... Almost every other book has a hefty component about it in it. Oh, well. So, this week, Infrastructure in the Colonies, Shipyards of the Commonwealth and Empire. Now, it was proposed by Wayne Boring, it's one of the patron ones, and specifically... It's a good one. Now, the currently the patron suggestions for August are live as we speak. People suggesting them. The patron vote will start on Sunday, but I will have made the decision Saturday and uploaded it all before I go away. And I'll be announcing the results of the vote on the following Sunday at the next live. Because remember, there's going to be no lives next week. However. There is going to be a video coming out every single day. I know this because I'm in the process of recording them all. 
I have so far recorded Sunday and Mondays. Um, this will of course be Saturdays, this Saturdays. Uh, Fridays I've got written up. I've got Tuesdays written up. I've got Thursday, Friday and the following Saturdays written up. Yeah, all done. It's going to be fun. Roland, I will never hear a bad word said against your lovely wife. She's a lovely lady. I'm sure if she's interrupting me, it's for a very good reason. Hello, Jonathan Barrow. Hello, dh 9 Hello, Andrew Paul. Hello, Night Singer. Interestingly, something I've been thinking about recently is I've been pondering what shipyards and naval bases that a British Imperial Federation would have. Well, this is going to be an interesting consideration of this topic, because it depends on who's running that Imperial Federation and what kind of personality they are. DH9, even if clock, YouTube didn't send me the going live notification, sadly. Well, I'm only starting at 7 o'clock to uh, today, so, you know, should be okay. Sure, you have not, you've not missed much. Hi, Santa Canera, how else to shore? Hello, everyone. As I skip, video every day. Oh dear, I'm still digging through all the stuff you made for Canada. <laughs> well, I'm hoping the sound is better. For some reason, I found that this microphone is far better at recording if it's balanced on the base it was supplied with. Do not know why. Than if it's balanced on the hanging jib, which I got given with it. And I have no idea why. It shouldn't be that way at all. But... Until I figure it out, what I've done is I've left it on the base it was supplied with, and the hanging jib, I'm working out where I'm going to put it. Because with the redesigned room, mm, spaces have changed. And speaking of things that have changed, let's on. Yay! Sorry, I have got my Christmas, <coughs> not Christmas, my um, <coughs> my multicolored lights, which I have in the room up. At some point, I'm going to start unwrapping all the things which are breakable in here. Once I'm happy, I've got everything in the right order. <sighs> Hello, Dan. Hello, Karma Gesberg. Hello, Felix B. Hello, Wayne. Very glad to see you're here. So, with that all said and done, infrastructure in the colonies, shipyards are come off an empire. First things first, there is a complete change in Royal Navy strategy and infrastructure prior to and after First World War. Prior to the First World War, you have a very interesting policy of we're going to construct things abroad around the Empire and try and boost our infrastructure around the Empire. After the First World War, there is a change. The British government becomes more and more concerned and more and more looking internally, worrying about internally. Not the wider empire and how that will boost Britain, but more and more what doing stuff in the UK, a lot of focusing everything in the UK, will do for their re-election prospects. It's a transition. It's one of the things which is recognised would happen after a major war. It's one of the reasons why the British had the Commonwealth Plan and sort of were planning for that to an extent, was because they didn't want to be bothered to continue running an empire. At a certain point, they thought they'd be tired of it. Slightly strange policy, I know, but, um, you know, these things happen. But there is a real problem. And this is something you're going to hear a lot in this week, and the Allied and the uh, Allied, basically, major uh, the major Allied 
what uh, what were the five problems, and how could they have fixed them? Discussion. Because there's a lot of things they could have done to fix them, and there's a lot of things they didn't do, which they could have done. John Murray, could the BRN make dockyards that would fit Hood in any uh, any Commonwealth countries? If they'd invested the money, yes. Hi, Hellshot. Hi, Darius. And hi, Shimmy. It all comes down to, as um, Night6831 has just put it in the chat, money and infrastructure. You don't have infrastructure if you're not willing to invest money. But if you invest the money in infrastructure, you tend to be able to make more money out of a place. It's a very short-termist perspective of someone if they do not wish to invest in infrastructure. Infrastructure raises the baseline of any nation and of anything you are dealing with. If you are dealing with an empire as a whole, if you invest in the infrastructure, if you invest in the dockyards, in the railways, in the roads, in the shipyard, in you know, in the ports, on those facilities, you will reap rewards. They won't be short term because they're large amounts of money that are required to be invested. But those rewards will come to you and those rewards will multiply. Because the one thing you can rely on about infrastructure is infrastructure that makes ease of movement of people, of goods, and things. Those things can be your water, you know, your warships, your etc. Anything that makes that easier and cheaper or more viable is going to increase the amount of movement. Anything that increases the amount of movement is going to increase the amount of commerce. The basic rule that underpins all of economics is person A selling something to person B. Whether that's a service or a good, that is the basic rule of economics. A selling to B, the lowest point. Now, the thing is, infrastructure is what makes that sale possible. Because person A, where are they? And person B, where are they? The, to make the most money as a government, you want to be able to charge tax. But you want person A, therefore, to be getting the most money from their sale. So they need to be able to sell to the person B who are prepare, prepared to pay the most for that good or service. Ergo, you need the infrastructure to make that happen. This is why governments are getting so worried about internet productivity and internet access. Not because they have an egalitarian love for giving the world knowledge, to be honest, an informed electorate is really quite annoying in a democracy. It means they might not believe you when you say you've done something spectacular. They might think you've done something spectacularly wrong instead. No, they want that because quite a lot of the goods that are now being sold are services. And a lot of those can be done digitally and passed from one place to another by the internet. So, therefore, internet access, speed, allows you to do more, allows you to upload bigger files more quickly, more efficiently. Anything which makes you more efficient and more gives you more access improves your ability to earn income. If you consider now, at this base point, because, as I've told you all, currently, technically, I'm unemployed. <laughs> I love it. It's, it's uni lecturer thing, as said. A contract lecturer... Technically unemployed over these two months of the year. Life happens. But what does that mean? Well, that means for me, basically my requirement, it means that 
my entire income stream is service-based. It is me providing history, historical content, to you over YouTube, over this by this medium, using the internet, using the infrastructure of the electricity production, the telephone lines, the electricity ca electric cables which provide the power here, the telephone cables that provide the internet access, and all the servers, all the systems which we don't even think about in the hub and spoke and sort of interconnected interconnected mesh network that is the global internet all the undersea cables all those things going around the world that is all infrastructure investing in that is a long term payoff okay the trouble is in the 1920s and 30s there is a transition prior to the 1920s and 30s if i was talking about these countries, if prior to World War I, I could be talking about big, grandiose British investment infrastructure programs. I could be talking about British procuring stuff in India. I will be talking about the various generations these things went through. But in the 1920s and 30s, especially the 1930s, now, there is an argument that the major economies which they would normally invest in are theoretically becoming self-governing governing dominions and they expect to invest in themselves. But the problem is those countries at the same point are still dependent upon Britain for their defence and security. So it's... To an extent... It's Britain which has got to lead the way in showing them how to invest in defence and procurement. And Australia is going to be a very good example, and it's going to be the one I'm going to talk through the first. Because there's what the Royal, there's what the Royal Navy and the British government basically forced the Australian government to spend their money on, and there's what the Australian government actually do. Senator, what if the colonies had had the same in naval infrastructure density as the main island UK? They're never going to get that much, but they could have had decent infrastructure. That's right. The UK missed two upgrades with naval infrastructure. Pretty much the UK was supposed to do one, as I've said before, in 1916. The previous one they'd done is 1910. And then it goes 1922. And then it's 1928. And actually, the next one they actually do do is 1934s, where they do a sort of semi-round. And they're planning for another round in 1940, and World War II happens. And actually going to do something properly in 1940. Monster do you have a favourite book on this particular topic? <sighs> hmm. Not really. There are a few good books, but they're always good on sections. Uh, I have, courtesy of Jeremy Black and Rutledge, a very expensive book here, which is Britain as a Military Power, 1688 to 1815. And it's pretty good. But honestly, Nicholas Rogers' books, all these books have significant sections. Nicholas Rogers has whole chapters on infrastructure and investment. And they're all worth it. Cousins, are we really going to look at all these today? Are you willing to be up past until past window? I'm going to try my best to look at all of them today. Well, as an aside, if you guys are interested in monetary and infrastructure impact in the Korean Russia war, there are two good channels I found. Hmm. Um, yeah, lack of infrastructure is really hurting Russia because the basically, since the Soviet Union fell, and even slightly before the Soviet Union fell, no one's been investing in infrastructure in Russia. Their railways and their roads are drastically behind where they were. In the, in, in the 1980s, they were about level with the rest of the world. Give or take a bit. Oh, 
Hello, Melanie. On, on current infrastructure, the addition I would like uh, would make to the Commonwealth Torch um, passing tool would be re to repeat it with the Type 83 once built as a look what else you could have had. Hmm, fun. Um, question, is Malta a colony? Malta is a question mark. Malta is a protectorate. Malta is many things, but it's never quite anything at the same time. It changes. It's always special, though. It's always special. Now. Tian Wong, population sets a ceiling for the minions. Not really as much as you'd think. Doesn't really set it as much as you'd think. There are issues, definitely. But, again... One of the problems you've, you're dealing with is the infrastructure, because that population can support that construction if you have enough of a joined-up economy. How do you have enough of a joined-up economy? If you put in the infrastructure. And yes, that sounds pretty glib when you're talking about something the size of Australia, but the fact is, there's us looking at the the uh, the you know naval history crew from. Um, of course, Canada trip, but, you know, now looking at our next trip. Looking at Australia, the GAN. And the India Pacific Line. And you sit there and go, mm, but, but, but surely you should have more than a single track for most of these routes, etc. And all these things. It'd be really interesting to look at them, because those are major infrastructure projects. And you'd expect them to have others crossing and you'd probably expect a crossing town to have grown up in the middle of Australia where the two lines that sort of did that crossed and that to be a sort of a point for all the trains to sort of meet and for so trains can do that and all sorts of things So, how many of your relatives are we going to confuse with Cornwall when talking about Canada? I'm looking also to the Collingwood portion as well. There is going to be a lot of discussion of Canada, of my relatives. Um, there is a reason I'm wearing this particular shirt today. If you don't know, you don't know. But you should. So, without much further ado, Australia. The problem for Australia was two things. One, the Australian Navy government was obsessed with having cruisers. Cruisers were these big, sexy, beautiful things. Cruisers are lovely. Cruisers are wonderful. Cruisers require a level of infrastructure and industry to build, which actually makes them quite expensive when you aren't building that many. This means that consistently, even Cockatoo Island loses out in the 1920s and 30s, to British yards. Prior to that, Cockatoo Island had been built up. Cockatoo Island is built up to be something quite interesting. The Royal Navy especially encouraged the Australians to build up Cockatoo Island and to use it for building ships. And Tim Wong, shirt looks like a Scottish St. Andrews. No, wrong colour. Uh, wrong colour background for the St. Andrews cross. Ah, oh dear, scary. Two hundred ninety. Ah, my old stomping grounds of Penang. Hmm. Okay. Uh,
Wayne's World, sort of, Canada has two sets nationwide due to Canadian National not wanting Canadian Pacific to use their tracks. I agree with that. Who would want the CP to use the, the CN's tracks? And for the CP, who would want the CN to use their tracks? <laughs> yes, this is the topic I do like to drum into people's heads. So, what does Australia have in the beginning of the 1920s? Well, they actually have five fairly decent yards. They have Cockatoo Island, which has produced actual cruisers. They have New South Wales State Dockyard at Walsh Island in Newcastle. They have Williamstown Dockyard in Melbourne and Pool and Steel in uh, Pool and Steel in Adelaide, and uh, Walkers Limited in Maribor. Here's the thing: in the 1920s, the Australian Navy orders 22 ships. After they've ordered those ships, those yards promptly close. Because they've got no more orders. Because whilst Australia has a massive heavy iron and steel industry, which is actually a critical supply line, the Australian government aren't interested in investing in things which would keep these yards going. In fact, even Cockatoo Island, which does stay going, is mostly kept going thanks to it being used for repairs, refits, maintenance more than shipbuilding. As we discussed many times, there is an entire class the whole way through the 1920s of ships which are not limited, and through the 1930s, which are not limited by anyone. Sloops, auxiliaries as we call them, vessels which can be up to 2,000 tons, up to 20 knots, and have a certain number of guns, as long as they didn't carry torpedoes. Well, Pretty much any nation could have kept their facilities going by building those. And they wouldn't have broken the bank. Australia could have kept churning out a few of those a year to keep Cockatoo Island going and keep another couple of these, uh, uh, these going. You could go, well, those ships wouldn't be that useful. Well, yes and no. They're also vessels that once you're done with them, or when you, if you get to a number and you just want to keep the churn going, you can sell them off. They're usually able to be converted into merchant vessels quite easily. They are usually viable for other things. They are often used for oceanography work, for minesweeping work, for being naval and diplomatic yachts. They can be used to support lighthouses and as a, you know, one of those vessels. There are all sorts of functions that you can use those ships of roughly that size and roughly that calibre for. But most importantly, it's going to keep your infrastructure and construction going. After the town class cruisers, Australia doesn't build any cruisers. They don't. And the town class cruisers I'm talking about are the 1910s ones pre-World War One vessels. They build two of them, both at Cockatoo Island. That's a yard which could have been kept going in full thrush by building sloops. That's These are also yards which have largely been built up not not early in the age of sail. These aren't yards then. These are yards built up in the age of iron and steel. Yards built up largely with British investment, but also some Australian, because it made sense to have facilities the other sides of the world that could support a fleet. Because if you can do shipbuilding, you can also do a major ship fabrication and part fabrication. If you can do major part fabrication, you can do repairs on ships which are pretty heavy duty. You see where I'm going? If you want to be able to operate a battle fleet the other side of the world, you need to have a lot more than just the ships which can get there and the fuel when they get there. You need to have the shipyards that can maintain them. You need to have the dry docks, but that's great. We can, we can dock our ship. Yay, they're nice and dry. 
Hang on, where are the parts going to have to come from? They're going to have to come from the UK. Oh. Why? Because despite this being quite a large and fairly advanced population, which does have a few universities which are in the middle of sheep paddocks, but, you know, that's they're still good universities. Um, we have some small issues in that we don't have the ability to make these parts. It's absolutely absurd that in World War II, Australia, which has all the iron and other industries it has, doesn't have the shipyard facilities, etc., to rapidly start churning out its own destroyers. It's patently absurd, and it's not something just because of the British government, but it's also the Australian government. And it's completely oxymoronic when you consider and their strategy prior to World War I. World War I was going to be a war in Europe. Everyone was really focusing on Europe. And Australia is actually building up these facilities and these capabilities. And then suddenly, post-World War I, going into the 1920s, 1930s, Australia is suddenly really worried about its defence and really worried about Japan. And instead of going, you know what? We need to build our shipbuilding industry. We need to start building some ships. <gasps> we can't build destroyers. They're treaty limits. <gasps> we can build ships which are pretty much destroyers in every way. We can actually build a design that uh, if we extend a bit in future and add in an extra two turbines and two shafts would actually get up to destroyer speeds. But, and, and, you know, another funnel for its bo for the for boilers. But it, it, if we built it just with one funnel and one set of boilers and one set of turbines and two shafts, uh, it would be it would be a sloop. And uh, you know, then we could we could build these and we could train our yards. Yes, we could, but they don't do that. You know, again, please note this: the idea that long-term thinking is something modern politicians have lost and that previous generations of politicians have this is completely wrong. It's cut up there with knights going, ah, oh, it was my grandfather's generation. They were the truly honourable warriors. They were the truly code, you know, chivalric code of knights. No, no, no. There has never been a generation of politicians who were truly long-term thinking. Why were the ones prior to World War I so much longer-term thinking than the, this generation? Probably because the ones prior to World War I were still thinking like previous generations of politicians, in not in terms of being in power for the next election, but they presumed they'd be in power for 20, 30 years. They weren't thinking about next election. They were thinking about the next election and the next, next, next election, in which place investing in infrastructure really does pay off. Plus, there is a kind of vein in the Victorian era where it's just cool to invest in engineering and infrastructure. It's just cool. It's something governments do because it is cool. I was asking you, so the Bathurst Corvettes were really the best Australia could build? Mm, pretty much. That's it. Why didn't they use the Australian Yards to build more ships for the RN than get those ships transferred to the RN? And then, and then get those ships transferred to the Royal Australian Navy. Because the Royal Navy... Uh, nice way, where are the British government going to build ships for the Royal Navy? Don't take this the wrong way. But if you're a British government and you order ships in a foreign yard, you'd better have a good reason for it. Like every yard in Britain had better be full. Because otherwise there's going to be a hue and cry over it. There's also the sheer problem that actually the shipyards in Glasgow and the shipyards in Belfast and the shipyards in Newcastle are cheaper to build in than the Australian ones. So for Britain, there's a lot of incentives to build uh, incentives to build the ships in Australian yards. But those are things which the Australian government shouldn't really be thinking about when they're offsetting that cost against employing Australians and build, strengthening Australian infrastructure. Now, Prior to World War One, yes, the Australian government had been prepared to pay for that, prepared to pay for these ships to be built in Australian yards. Post World War One, oh no, 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 no. We'll get them built in Britain and get them over here then.
Oh no, gosh, I thought you had a new abusive name for Australia for a minute there with Cockatoo Island. Nope, Cockatoo Island was the name of the dockyard. Hello, Paul Amos. <clears throat> Just like, ah, I knew the sheep would eventually enter the conversation on Australia. <laughs> I like the sheep. My um, my first ever name and my first ever history professor, who the first one ever taught me, um, Glenn Richardson, is Australian. A really nice Australian gent. And he has the picture, and he showed it to us a couple times in class, and it was really quite fun to look at. Red Turf Ox. It was also due to an economic concern as well. How does an Australian shipyard economically compete with the giant shipbuilding companies? Well, that is quite true. There are the legitimate problems of how do you compete with the giant shipbuilding companies. But here is the thing. If a shipyard has a consistent flow of income from government projects, so let's say the government picks three yards and says, we'll be ordering a sloop from you every year. Okay. That sloop is going to provide them with a base level of income. A base level. They'll be guaranteed a sloop every single year. So they can then take that to the bank and go, well, this is the investment we've got. The government's building sloops on us every year. Um, we're setting up a Parsons or a Brown Curtis subsidiary out here to supply turbines. And uh, what we'd like to, we now like to sort of, we're going to compete for other projects. And if you consider the amount of ore going out of Australia, the amount of stuff flowing around, again, it's investing in infrastructure. If you've got the shipyards there, People will use them. Why will they use them? Because if you're an Australian firm and you want to build a ship, well, yes, you can build it in the UK and it's going to be cheaper. But if you're an Australian firm and you build it in Australia, then perhaps your government is going to give you a tax break to build it in Australia. Perhaps they incentivize your using your building Australian. There are many ways for a government to do this, which then leads to employment and better infrastructure for them. And as the shipyards grow, they can eventually compete. No company comes into the world fully formed a massive monolith which can compete with the giant companies. But if you support it, sucker it, and properly make it sure it, can, it has the grounds to grow, it can grow. And it can do it. Journeyman, in other words, build destroy a light. That's what we call a sloop. Red Tail Fox. I'm pretty sure we built a few Red Tail River Class frigates too. You did build a few River Class frigates as well as Bathurst Class Corvettes. And in both cases, you had to deal, get a lot of supplies from America and Britain for it. You could build good ships, but they're not exactly massive ships, are they? Well, let's be honest. A frigate and a Corvette in World War II two are not exactly going to set your world alight. They also built some tribal class destroyers at Cockatoo Island. And they're good ships. But Cockatoo Island between 1909 and 1990 builds 30 ships. It builds 30 ships in 81 years. And that's your naval dockyard. There are British shipyards which are not around for 30 years and still build 90 plus ships. And admittedly, I'm not again saying that Australia has to do the same level of investment as Britain does, but they are in a very large island nation. They are most of Australasia as a continent. And they are surrounded by water, so you'd expect them to need a lot of patrol boats. Again, this is the other thing. If you're building sloops, they could be for the Navy, they could be for a Coast Guard. 
you could be building them for a lot of reasons. And they can be very useful for a nation. And especially for a nation which is as reliant on external communication, i.e. oceanic communication, as Australia is for its infrastructure. And for its movement. As I say, well, our British government want you to build, uh, want to build its ship in British yards. They also want the whole Commonwealth to build their ships in British yards. It's quite logical, really. Mm, yes and no. The British government do. Prior to World War One, they're actually happy for the governments to build them abroad in their own yards and to have their own infrastructure. Post World War One, they get rather more keen on them building them in British yards. But that's a problem for Britain in terms of infrastructure outlook. Okay, amazing. What picture did you, who have, and why was it fun to look at? Okay, so my uh, one of my profs when I did my bachelor's, a guy called Glenn Richardson, very good professor of Renaissance history, is an Australian, and he has a print a, a picture of I think it was the University of Sydney or is it Adelaide, one of the major universities of um Australia, and it's surrounded by sheep. Rolling cash. Talking of infrastructure investment, my first sea lord just, just got on her London train and the standing room only looks like terrible. That does sound terrible. Canada, we haven't got to yet. We're going in alphabetical order of the countries because I just felt like it. My turn. In the hearts of iron and history, the British industrialized India a decade early and that leads to British having equal industrial capacity to the USA. It's certainly been interesting, that one. Stafford, okay. Um, this actually, I'm going to discuss this because it actually does actually get into the whole infrastructure issue. So, before you can get more trains for the car, uh, more, car uh, more carriages for our trains, you need to first lengthen the space of the points, and you need to lengthen the actual platforms so that people can disembark from them. You need to design the infrastructure around carriage lengths, uh, train lengths, which are longer, basically, and you need to rebuild it. This is the same problem that comes up whenever everyone goes, goes, so why don't you have double-decker carriages? And the usual response is, because our bridges aren't tall enough over our railways. <sighs> It's because of a lot of these things, it is a long-term perspective. Now, HMAS Adelaide is one of those town-class cruisers built in Australia in Cockatoo Island. The point is this. If you can build a light cruiser of this standard prior to World War I, if you kept building them at a pace of a light cruiser every of this level every few years... You could have kept that yard not only going very well, you would have built up a fairly strong navy for the for the Australians. No, sorry. Well, thirty ships in eighty years makes total sense, especially those ships are cavalry ship. By the way, these are the largest ships which are ever built by Cockatoo Island. Okay, largest ones. I right, too. A local yard also doesn't need to direct compete with the big players. It just needs to be mildly profitable and provide its strategic service, and you can grow it. Were there any commercial shipbuilding yards in Australia at the time? Well, the thing is, 
four of those are commercial. The New South Wales State Dockyard technically is a commercial dockyard. The Williamston Dockyard in Melbourne, uh, the Pool and Steel in Adelaide, and the Walker's Limited in Maribor are all, to an extent, commercial. Either completely commercial for the last three, semi-commercial, and Cockatoo is the naval one. So anyway, would a free meter track with help always be worth it for Australia? Possibly, but you'd have to relay the entire uh, entire railway in that end of work and change everything. So I think you might end up having a trouble. Yes, this is a World War One town class. <clears throat> yeah, didn't think they were building battleships and carriers uh, and carriers. I meant that tongue in cheek. I guess so, but I wanted to. How do I put this? Emphasize the point. This is the largest thing they built, and there are good reasons for that. Like there are good reasons. My, I have a model board out to cut the carpet up. Um, Cruisers make sense for Australia. They also have a battle cruiser, which they build in the UK. So they do have some idea of having status units. And they are a nation used to investing in their navy in the prior to World War I. World War II, in the interwar period, they, these things change. And it's, it, it's something you sort of really realise when you look at Australia. They often go through periods of, we're going to invest in a Navy, and it gets really well funded. And then they almost ignore it for 20-odd, 30 years. And then it they suddenly go, hang on, we're in real trouble with our Navy, we need to invest in it again. So they invest in it again, get everything up and going, and then they ignore it again for 30 years. And they wonder why it costs them so much money each time, and it's because of that. Again... If you're able to use, and I know I keep going back to sloops, but this is the point about the 1920s and 30s, and also, to an extent, you could have done the same thing prior to World War One and any period. You can keep a shipyards going with a constant flow of cheap and cheerful. There are two areas where they need to have high-tech skills in order to produce decent ships. Once you into engine, once you're into the age of steel and steam, engines. So that's why a sloop is quite a good thing to build, rather than a corvette or a frigate. Uh, corvettes and frigates sometimes don't have tur. Well, some of them don't have turbines, but some of them don't. Most don't. Whereas sloops are like destroyers; they always, they usually have turbines. And if you're building something with two shaft turbine design. That can be your sloop. Or it could be a single shaft turbine design if you really wanted. To get you up to 20 knots. And your destroyer design then has two shafts. But as long as you're building those turbines and you're building the equipment out, you're building pretty much a destroyer on the uh, destroyer, all the thing, skills you need to build a destroyer in the sloop. Yes, you're not putting in a torpedo launcher and torpedoes, but Honestly, that's the stuff on the top. If you're building sloops, you will have a domestic gun industry that will build destroyer level guns. If you're and also probably build guns you can use for land artillery in various other positions, which is quite useful. If you're building sloops, you can build you will have the facilities needed to build turbines and also gearboxes and shafts and all the level of stuff you need for destroyers. And if you can churn out destroyers, then you can churn out destroyer if you can churn out destroyers and sloops, then you suddenly have enough ships that you can be very useful to your allies and also very useful to yourself. Those double single guns on the front of World War One cruisers look so goofy to me. 
They are certainly interesting. They're an interesting aesthetic. Red Tail Fox, and there were a number of small uh, ones scattered around. There were one building small coastal cargo ships in Brisbane right up to the 1980s. Uh, but yeah, those were the big ones. Yes. There are some small yards. And again, the small yards can be kept going with orders of trawlers and things like that. <sighs> How do you put this? Eliminating the possibility for misunderstanding to occur. Misunderstanding to occur. That's what I was trying with the whole pointing out thing. I think. That's the answer to that question. Um... General Bowen, why didn't Commonwealth build more cruisers or bigger ships? Lack of infrastructure? That's it. It's lack of infrastructure. And lack of investment in the infrastructure. So before you can have the infrastructure, you need to invest in the infrastructure. And before you invest in the infrastructure, you need to take an actual perspective and actual think about what you want to build. If you look at the current programs we're dealing with today and the issues we've got going on in the world, in most of the navies and armies, etc., you can see it as a lack of infrastructure. And infrastructure is not just roads and railways. Those are important things. But it's actually having the production facilities. If you decide it's essential that you, have, you can build armoured vehicles in your country, not even ships, just build armoured vehicles, then you need to make sure you have the ability to produce armour, so the right capabilities in your probably your steel foundries and the ability to make uh, rate uh, make the right alloys and the right mixes uh you need to have a factory which has the right skills right fabricating uh, capabilities etc and assembly capabilities and you need to make sure that's all in a place which can do it Where you can get and bring everything together. That's actually a lot of stuff which you need to join up. Thank you, Wayne. That's all. If they've been allowed to keep Australia to study and use as a floating university ship, how could their industry have benefited from such a tangible example of engineering achievement? Not much. Honestly, Australia wouldn't have been good as a floating university ship. Um, it would have been good as a float, as a flagship, but actually what would be better would have been HMS, HMS Tiger transferred to them as a flagship. That would have been quite useful. Going on, it's a good a horde of small ships, a good base of officer counter. Yep. Polymus, is there a book on British, uh, British and Commonwealth, British and Commonwealth dockyards and shipbuilders? Not really. There are some infrastructure books going around. Uh, I put one away earlier. Did I put it up here? Ba -ba -ba -ba. No, not there. I know I put it up somewhere. No, that's the naval railway section. Sorry, hunting book. It's getting used to new organization of books. I know I've put them, put it away somewhere. But where have I put it away? No, that's sea flight. Oh. No, that's building wooden ships, not building... That's not the shipyards themselves. British shipbuilding. 1500 to 2010 uh, is... This one? That's a fairly decent one. And there's another one which is about empire shipbuilding, which I've got somewhere around here. I know I've done it in a previous video where I talked about infrastructure. I have shown the books. Um... I wonder where that one is. Why do I feel like that's down on the floor? No, that's the Grand Fleet. No, no. 
No. Sorry. Can't find it. Oh well. I have got the other one. It is somewhere around here. But, um, yes. Boom. Why did I put this? I put the slides book back. Yeah. Brush opening. I tell you, if the Aussies had kept building light cruisers, then by World War II, you could have probably built CVs and CVLs in that yard if you really wanted to. Maybe even build a larger stator ship like a heavy cruiser. Yeah. If you keep building light cruisers and you keep building, basically every time the British launch a new design of light cruiser, you go, we're going to build a couple of those. You might have even built the counties, the Australian counties in Cockatoo Island if you kept going. How does the Battle Atlantic go? If the British had the yards, then they could pump out ASW ships like they are going out of styles. The British do have... Uh, the British do pump out anti-submarine warfare ships like they're going out of style. The trouble is, the British start about 6 to 12 months later than they should do. If World War II hadn't happened till 1942, the British by that point would have had a few hundred brand new ASW escorts to call upon, and it would have been very interesting watching what happens. Lions, problem with all this is it requires planning and forethought. However, to uh, the rank you uh, have gone through four different governments in the time you need to get this sorted out. Yep. Camzy, did uh, Australia have any dry docks big enough to take Tiger? Theoretically, they did, yes. Uh, Finals for you. That photo of Adelaide is when she visited British Columbia, Canada in 1924. Yes, as part of the Special Services Squadron. What is interesting, though, is that there is quite a lot of infrastructure invested in Australia. You know, th this is a classic example. Prior to World War II, the British, as part of the defence of the far of the Far East plan, insists on Australia building these huge fuel dumps. And I mean, if Japan had really put their minds on it and gone for them, they would have found so much fuel they'd have been in ecstasy because the fuel dumps that the british build uh, that the british and australians build in australia are still there to this day and here you can take a tour of them and certainly if we go to australia that's one thing i will be enjoying looking at a tour of uh is our uh, colossal and they basically keep the war effort going and there's a reason why the various forces drawing fuel from them are never ever going Oh, we're worried about our fuel supplies. We might run out. No. We won't. Basically, if the Royal Navy had matched its destroyer construction in the 1920s and 30s with sloop construction, and then had matched that construction again with sloops being constructed across to Commonwealth in um, Empire and Commonwealth in terms of Canada, Australia, India, and South Africa. They would have had, a, well, the best part of nearly 200 escorts to start World War II with. And... That's before we include V&W class destroyers and all the other things which will be used.
So, yeah. There are advantages if they actually pay attention and use the treaties. Thank you, Wayne. To encourage actors to write the definitive book, Commonwealth and Empire Shipbuilding during the Age of the Iron and Steel, with commentary on long-term impacts of each choice and had on its day. Oh, that would turn into a massive... There is a real worry I am with the current... the, the series I'm doing for next week that they're going to turn into rants. I, think, I doubt the Australia is 134,000 tonnes. Night, 681... That's just in one installation in Darwin. <sighs> the um, total fuel which the Royal Australian Navy and etc. stored. Um, let's see. I've got. I think it's a few million, but I forget which tons of oil is stored in Australia. Britain's, yeah. It's a few million tons worth of fuel, I think. Yes. In total. There are dozens of storage points. Dozens. This was just a local one in Darwin. And that's that specific depot. Most of it, Seneca guaranteed us because there are installations of stock in other locations. Yeah, I think in Darwin alone there was something like five installations or something like that. I, I'm not 100% sure. I was reading through a massive infrastructure plan, and when I say massive infrastructure plan, it's a document that thick and going, mm, this is going to be interesting to try and memorize it this week. Oh. Well, on the book Claxons, I have just got... Well, I am starting another book. Uh, I've been asked by... While I'm writing my next big book, I've been asked by Osprey to write a smaller book. So I'm writing an Osprey book on flower glass Corvettes. Because Sackville deserves it. But no, this is part of what they're sort of planning. They're putting out all these things. 
because that's what they're there for. They weren't building the shipyards, they had all the fuel oil for the base the fleet to be based on. The idea was this, okay, and the Far East plan, if we start going into it, is you have Singapore as the theatre entry, where all the ships gather and then go up the South China Sea, East China Sea, taking points they go, operating from da 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 da, da. You have fuel sold in Singapore, that will be sent up. That fuel will be re replenished from supplies stored in Australia, which will be brought up by, sh uh, by tanker, and of course supplies coming from the Middle East. But the idea was that you wanted an uninterrupted flow of fuel. So you needed to have that fuel close at hand stored, but stored in a safe space. Because the Japanese might launch a surprise attack on Singapore at the beginning of the war. They won't get down to Australia was the idea. It was too far away. They wouldn't have gone and attacked there. Besides, in Australia, you have a lot more space to hide fuel. A lot more space. Night 6831, America has so much fuel that other than Singapore's amount don't make a difference. Okay. Night 6831, here is a small problem if you're the US forces operating in the southeast route and that sort of area. Where's your fuel coming from? Oh, it's got to come all the way across the Pacific. So you've got to bring all the fuel with you across the Pacific to operate. Or you can use the fuel which is already there. What do you think they're going to do? Make a big statement about using the fuel from across the world? Or use the fuel that's there? That's what they do. That's what the fuel was there for, to support operations. The fact was that fuel never really ran out. They did restock a bit during the war. There were some supplies, but honestly, they were still using up that fuel. The stock, the amounts were just stock being stockpiled by the end of the war, because that fuel being stockpiled with the idea of fighting a massive war. And yes, America can bring a lot of fuel from America, but that means you have to bring use tankers to bring that fuel across when you could be using tankers for other things. No decision yet on names. So, Canada. Well, Canada's another story. Canada has thriving dockyards in some respects and thriving industry and industrial capacity. Um, there's one small problem. At the end of World War One, so a government decides, you know what, what we should do is form the Canadian Government Merchant Marine. And this will be uh, this will maintain shipyard employment and continue Canada's position in ocean shipping by supporting it. Well, when I discussed uh, just to point out for those wondering on the about the shirt, when I first brought it uh, mentioned it, people were discussing Cornwall, so perhaps you should start looking up Cornwall. Okay, that might be a hint of what the shirt is. Now, there's a problem with this. The idea was that the government would provide the support and to keep this merchant marine, make it profitable to provide infrastructure support to get the Canadian industry going around the world and to keep their support going. But the trouble is they stop deciding to invest in it. They get a new government, and the government doesn't continue the investment because they don't feel like it. And so as the vessels become obsolete, instead of being replaced, they're written off. And then the Great Recession, the Depression happens, and they basically discontinue any investment. This means that by 1936, a fleet which would, be, would have been a very useful thing to have in World War II had ceased to exist, if it had been maintained in numbers. 
In fact, from 1930 to 1939, the Canadian shipyards, then existent, built only 14 steamers, which exceeded 46 metres in length. And as a result, if they're not building ships for anyone else and they're not got that coming through, for some reason they become uncompetitive competing for ships for the lakes. Which means, where do those orders go to? Do they go to American yards? No, they go to British yards. And British, uh, British build lake steamers. Now, for Canada, this is a problem. Canada then has to spend a huge amount of money investing in growing their industry. And they keep having to grow their industry. World War II is as expensive as it was in many ways because things hadn't been built in peacetime. Again, the Canadians, if they'd been building some sloops, could have helped keep those yards going. They built some merchant ships, could have helped keep those yards going. They could have, they had both vehicles open to them. They could have ordered sloops for the Navy, for the RCN. They could have ordered, without affecting treaties, without any limitations. And they could have ordered merchant vessels for their own Canadian Government Merchant Marine Limited. And could have kept those shipyards going. Now, the usual point I run into here is when people start turning around to me and going, well, that sounds, you know, communist or etc. It's not. And honestly, quite a lot of the, government, the politicians in this period making the case for such orders are conservatives. And they're making the case based on the idea of strategic independence and strategic security i e it's not a good look for a government to be entirely dependent for building these things on foreign imports and foreign orders it's expensive And it's also undermining for themselves, because if you invest in this sort of thing, you can grow your technology sector, you can grow your engineering sector, you can grow your independence. Now, you don't want to have a large one, but let's be honest, if you've got the Canadian government merchant marine, if you're choosing to use it as a cash cow where you just drain money from it and don't invest any of the profits back, you end up with it going bankrupt and the issues you end up with. If you run it as a proper business, it can generate a profit for the government whilst also sustaining itself and your wider industry. Infrastructure, etc., is useful. Shipbuilding is a useful strategic capability to have. Going through constant cases of feast and famine when it comes to shipbuilding undermines that and undermines you. Now, hmm. it takes time, though, to do these things, and it takes time for these things to fall apart. 
it's one of the interesting things when I look into this is the fact that the Canadian government Merchant Marine Limited starts out at the end of World War One as this great investment in Canada, this great investment in building a new nation, in building a nation which is, you know, the whole land fit for heroes thing. And yet, very quickly, that falls down the criteria. Mostly because... And this is the reality of all these things. Mostly because they get focused on, the politicians especially, get focused on what's a short-term win. Isn't that exactly what happened with Battleships post treaty? Yeah, they didn't invest in them. Uh, sometimes the government running the things like a business. Uh, we're not the East Indian Company and the um, Hudson Bay Company wasn't allowed to take proper power here. So unfortunately, we don't have a proper example to write, learn from. Uh, it, it, I'm not sure if we'd call the East Indian Company always running things like a business. Sometimes they run them like an egocentric uh, uh, ego um, dictatorship. But there are some good... Uh, it, it's one of those scary things. Government doesn't tend to be necessarily the best at running a business, but you can structure it so the government's invested in it and providing investment and it's run as a business, with the government as the investors. You can structure it in that way, and give it oversight, with the government acting really as the shareholders and owners, rather than the managers and directors. It's kind of like when you run the fence properly. Uh, you have experts in terms of procurement, and experts, which what, if we consider again, go back to this period, if you were talking about the Admiralty, the Royal Navy tended to ask for its funding from the government, and the people who oversee all the procurement and creation of these stuff were direct uh, were naval constructors. Hello, mighty fluff. What are you up to? You coming to say hello or not? Oh, you are. Hello. Books. Things definitely for you not to be on. Hello. Right. So. It's. It's also long term capitalism, I have to admit. And this is something we see in the Caribbean. Bermuda is very much an artificial construct. It's not really an island for a population, but it's very suitable for setting up a dockyard. Most of the ones which are actually built in the Caribbean have issues. And when I say they have issues, I mean they have major issues. There are three built and abandoned in very short order. And the fact is, Bermuda is, of course, not nowhere near the Caribbean, really. But it becomes pretty much the de facto dockyard for that area of operations. Why? Be because it's easy enough to get to from them. And you can actually have a dockyard. You can actually have the facilities. You will not have fever constantly going amount amongst your personnel ashore. You will have them in a decent climate. In a decent area which doesn't have as many natural disasters. Ooh, where are you up to? Oh, you're so You're going to be a good boy? You're going to behave for sissy? Go on. I think he thinks you have a biscuit. <laughs> yeah, Raleigh. In the middle of a live, though, but yeah, in Raleigh. Because he's, um, mm hmm. <laughs> so, 
the carrot so this is a reality of a long term decision making process and one of the interesting things about the Bermudan dockyard is it's still very useful right into the 1930s it's a critical dockyard it's very useful in world war 2 it's a very useful facility one interesting thing is they have of course there is they have a floating dry dock because if they put an actual dug in one that would it was considered to be too much of an ups a risk to sort of the United States the USA might like it but having a floating dry dock there they couldn't really complain about as much because it can all be always be moved Manus, thank you for your thoughts on Canadian industry. The Canadians have a lot of potential there. The Caribbean has an issue in that supporting these yards. And they have the population in many ways that's inclined. But they don't have the infrastructure. They don't have the wider construction network. Bermuda, as wonderful a yard as it is, is always dependent upon the stores and supplies which are shipped over to it. So it's always, to an extent, an enhanced forward base, rather than an actual operating facility. India. This is one where I am going to cause probably some trouble, because I'm going to say this simply. In the Age of Sail, we are talking about one of the best sources of ships the British have. The ships built in India are built of the primer, uh, the uh, premium wood. They are incredibly strong. They're made of teak, mostly. And they are just wonderful Age of Sail ships. And they have wonderful dockyards. Now, these dockyards are just as advanced as their British counterparts. They have to be to work with this wood. And so, therefore, the idea that goes around that the Indians didn't have the level of education, etc., or anything like to support industrialization. Nope. It's investment. You would have needed to invest in these dockyards like you invested in Chatham, in Portsmouth, etc., to upgrade them into the age of industry. And you could have done it. And it would have been sensible. And you would have had absolutely amazing yards and the ability to produce them. Not building ships in India is the biggest mistake the British government make in the run-up to World War I and in the interwar years. And when I'm talking about building ships, I'm not saying necessarily you need to build cruisers or give the Royal Indian Navy a massive fleet. But sloops, again, destroyers, smaller ships, are certainly things you should be building in India for the Indian Navy. And you should ensure. And again, this can be ba ba blamed on the British government because, unlike the Australian government, they can, uh, the Indian government for this period is mostly run by the British Colonial Office. And the whole point of it being run by civil servants and these sort of people is they are supposed to be the long-term thinkers. If you have colonial secretaries, if you have governors, etc., they are supposed they're not think worried about elections. They're supposed to be thinking about the long-term good of the empire as a whole. Right? This is the thing. You're not just looking at it from the perspective of what can we do best. You're thinking about it from the whole, you're supposed to be looking at it from the good of the empire. They're failing in that. They're not just failing in what is good for India, but what is good for the empire. Having an India that produces decent ships, especially can produce its own small ships and maintain its own small navy, would have been really, really useful. Imagine the Indian navy if it had been able to be as rapidly expanded and as rapidly built up as the Canadian one was to provide an escort force. Imagine how capable British forces would have been, more capable British forces would have been, if they had not just the Canadian, but also the Indian Navy being built up in World War II to such a size. 
and that could have been done. If you consider the base the Canadians are working from, that's nothing compared to the base which the Indians had prior to the sort of 1890s and had slowly been degrading ever since because of lack of investment and lack of prioritization and prioritization and lack of long-term thinking. Go, squad. Industrializing colonies is a good way of encouraging independence movements. Home rule for dominion is okay because, well, the population is white. Not so the colonies. Yes and no. You have to remember, if you can go down the whole racist perspective, and that was certainly part of the thinking and part of the things going on. But honestly, with India especially, you have long-term ideas from an early point that it's going to go independent because... Again, and I don't really want to get into the whole race thing, but you have to remember they have. <clears throat> um, it's uh, this almost in the racism. There is almost a case system, okay. And I don't want to get into it, but Indians were presumed to be going independent at some point, uh, and would form a dominion at some point, and were heading in that direction. And so you do tend to build up an age, but also. This is going to sound, again, strange, but you already have quite a large educated class in India. You have to, because, and shock horror, India is mostly administered by Indians. Okay? There are Brits in the top spots for many of the posts. Almost all the top spots. But most of the civil service in India is actually Indian, not British. Most of the good people paid into the system are Indian, not British. The shipyards would have employed a lot of very smart, capable Indians. And again, the point that's often made, and again is just as realised, is that people who are employed have nice, stable jobs and nice, stable income, tend to be less rebellious than those people who are hungry. People who have the advancement tend to be one of very cautious and protective of the advancement they have. They want to look before they leap. You give someone uh, to uh, give someone something, they have to protect something. You take give them nothing, they have nothing to lose. It's a rather more cynical way of dealing with independence movements, but it's there. And trust me, the British are just as viable on that one as anyone else. So, a press age of territory, wouldn't 450 gun dragon carriers be able to be built in the Napoleon Wars? Probably, but would they be any help in the style of battles which are taking place? Hmm. Oh, yeah, and I should probably announce this, and I, as it keeps reminding remind me to do an advertisement, I'm not going to do an advertisement. Um, I always add in the adverts later. But um, you will notice there's now a shop thing should be showing up below, a shop banner. Apparently, once you get over a certain number of subscribers, I think it is roughly 8,000, your shop displays. And I've had a spreadsheet for a while, so there is now the shop function down below. And um, I'm quite proud of... Oh, I think that it's got brew ships on the back. Basically, I've used some of the designs, which are very Brian very kindly gave me, Brian Jeffries, and some of my own designs, mixed them together and made a shirt slash top and setup, which has the factors of ship design on the front, brew ships on the back, and has the uh, one logo on one side and the Naval History Live logo on the bu uh, bubble on the other side. So the channel logo on one side and the Naval History Live logo on the other side. It's cool. Bernison, India lacked the steel industry. Well, yes and no. India does not have... India does have a steel industry. It doesn't have a sufficiently invested in steel industry, but Australia does as well have a sufficient uh, in invested in steel industry. So there is source of steel relatively close in terms of production. 
So it does work together, and again, it allows you to bind them, bind the empire together. If Australian steel is going to India to help them produce ships, and it's also in the nicest way building shipyards and uh, in. Britain doesn't have a steel industry like we would have it today before they have the shipyards. One of the reasons why the steel industry grows is the growth of the shipyards. So if you invest in the shipyards, the steel industry grows to support to supply those shipyards with steel. If you invest in mil the military shipyards to produce this, the offshot of that tends to produce a civilian capability because there is steel going around, there are tools, there are people with the knowledge and skills of how to build steel and iron ships, and so people go and build it. It's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. So saying, oh, they don't have a steel industry, so they couldn't build ships. Well, if you build the shipyards and you start ordering the ships, they tend to develop the steel industry. It's a chicken and egg scenario. Assuming monsoons don't make a mess, well, in the nicest way, that shipyard had been there for several hundred years, for a few hundred years, and they'd be building teak ships through the monsoons. So I don't see how suddenly monsoons are going to start ruining it if they start to try to build steel or iron ships. There are lots of reasons you can come up with which sound very erudite, but they don't really work. Flashlight? Oh, sorry. I just realized I keep playing with, my, with the button on my screwdriver. Sorry. It's one of the things. <sighs> I, I keep forgetting. It, 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 this is the trouble. Is when I'm talking at university, I tend to wave around and have the mouse in my hand as I'm flicking along. Because that's how you control your slides and walk around the room. Because this has quite a long range. But the trouble is, if I flick around with it at home, it mucks up XSplit. So I don't do that. So now my hands are so used to having something in them, they grab whatever happens to me nearby, which is about the right size, and start playing around with it. So I apologize. So, Tonson, I may need to stop as I'm biting my tongue so much. Well, last year, how things are repeating today. Can't imagine how Full Z would have fared with Royal Indian Navy support. Would have certainly had a lot more escorts wandering around it, which might have helped put up a better air defense screen. That's good. People who have time to think about anything but work in food have time to think about a rebellion. Each way of operating has pros and cons for the occupiers. True. But people who have time to think about rebellion tend to go in. Let's put it this way: there is the poverty-driven rebellions tend to be bloody and very nasty, whereas the middle-class red-led rebellions tend to be more civilized. And uh, well, if we consider what actually happens in India gaining independence, to an extent, that path you could argue was a middle-class-led <clears throat> independence movement. What is the occasional whirring noise? You might be hearing the fan from the uh, poor uh, laptop. Take care, Roland. Then, just listen to Britain's uh, pro uh, podcast on Indian partition. I'm not thrilled with Britain's approach to India from 1875 onwards, and just see it as a massive waste of potential. It is a tremendous waste of potential. Absolutely colossal waste of potential. Lance, do you know if any of these book, new books you're working on are going to be made in audiobooks? I keep pushing for some of them to be made into. Andrew Paul, one of the problems with India's steel industry in the late 80s and early 90s was, was lack of investment. An increase there would have brought about more conglomerates taking up steel as well. Yes. Basically, if you invest, it's, it's again with the infrastructure, etc. Investment tends to beget growth. It's one of the problems that you get into because there is a strong modus operandi in certain spheres that you... It, it, what I find always strange is they're the same people. If you were talking, if they were talking to a 
company, they go, you have to spend money to make money. Okay? But the moment they turn around talking to a government, they're going, you have to cut spending to make money. And actually, usually, well, the thing is, you actually have to target spending more. Cutting it can cause a lot of trouble. It does sometimes need to cut, and etc. cetera, these things. And your government spending should fit what you actually need for your criteria. What you decide you want your government to do, that's what it's spending. You know, you, as I've said before, it's not so much a small government or big government. It's the right size government for what you want to do. You need a government which is no bigger or smaller than to do than you need to do exactly what you wanted to do. If you want it to run a healthcare system, it's going to need to be big enough to run the healthcare system. If you want it to just be about the fence, police, and that's it, that's what you need to do. If you want it to look, it, but governments should also be looking after infrastructure because let's be honest that's the sort of thing which is going to be big expense you don't want you want people thinking in terms of hundreds of years not five years if you can complain to do it malaya and singapore are critical pieces of investment malaya doesn't have really any industry or anything to support singapore singapore grows up as a massive space because it is this choke point this natural confluence position of world events they will all flow through singapore and again the point is often that malaya and singapore are included in the same bracket as india because it is part of the defense of india and part of the defense of australia and again here is the, my my point in terms of this if you have singapore built up and you have australian indus india potentially investing properly in terms of their defense and security in maritime infrastructure ways, then you would have ships regular, though they would probably be forward basing forces at this confluence point. And again, what would be a good thing to, well, if you have steel flying from Australia to India to help with air ship production, uh, etc., and thing, uh, you could have a lot of goods flying from India to Australia to help them, that would change things. Honestly, you probably end up with a lot of people going, but a lot of a lot of people going both ways as well, if you have goods flying it, which could be good for Australia as well, because that would be a population boost. Guns and uh, banning hands. I find it quite relaxing since I do it myself. <laughs> Just used to having something in my hand. <laughs> oh, yeah. I thought you had new kit, like a camera. No, I don't have new kit. Unfortunately, again, um, let, let's put it this way: the university. They've got one more paycheck left in this academic year, which comes at the end of this month. Hopefully, they're going to catch up everything they owe me. I have to say, there has been some new kit arrived for the computer. There has been some new kit arrived for the computer, which is a docking port for the laptop, because that allows me to plug everything into it, apart from, apparently, the screens. But everything else is now plugged into the docking port. Which means they don't get moved around and the, the, the things don't keep getting changed every five minutes. Which does help them. Good luck, Jonathan Morrow. How to foresee having a couple of Indian made and crewed light crews and the destroyers would have been a very nasty surprise for those IJ bombers. It would have been, it, it wouldn't necessarily have been destroy, light crews and destroyers. It could well have been Indian and maybe even Australian if they're both investing in sloops. And those would still have been a nasty surprise, because, let's be honest, if they're sloops and they can go up to 20 knots, they can keep up the cruising speed of those ships, and they can provide a lot of extra firepower. And especially if they're hanging around, they might, sadly enough, soak up some torpedoes as well.
Come on, guys. Elected governments better have the power to uh, nationwide resist multinational corporations in small countries. This automatic, almost automatically means a level considered big government. It's interesting. There is certainly a legitimate thing that you know a nation needs to be able to have the legal and political clout to be able to stand up to mm, some of the more non-governmental organizations which might influence it these days. Bunker Disraeli, hello. How uniform was the production of bunker fuel at the time production of pure oil for our chips? Did the quality of local refining affect local uh, location storage facilities? It was pretty much uniform. You have to remember, bunker fuel is pretty much the nastiest of the nastiest stuff. It is the almost the least refined. It is terrible stuff. Absolutely terrible stuff. Um, so its storage is fairly standard. It's the cheapest and easiest to get. Well, the Soviets spread infrastructure among the SSR, the Soviet Satellite Republics, and Warsaw Pact. This has crippled the Russian Federation. Not as much as they like to claim they did. They did put some of the stuff in Ukraine, etc., but no. That was mainly because they treated Ukraine as almost an extension of Russia at several points. Despite the Ukrainians definitely not feeling they were an extension of Russia. Well, so does the Iron still have the large dry docks that were available in World War II, and if not, what happened to them? They still have some of them. Uh, some of them have now been turned into, well, various things. Some of them, are, some of the docks have been sold off and built over and turned into flats, etc. Some of them are now commercial facilities. Some of them have been cut down. Some of them have just lost their facilities in terms of dry dock because they've lost their Cassian, so they no longer really are viable. Uh, you'd have to build a new Cassian and uh, basically put in a new pumping station in order to make them work. And yeah, there are some interesting things going on, but yeah, there's also some good stuff. Actually, just going to put this up because I think it would be sensible about that. Hello. Suffered. Uh, for the rest of the hand situation, you thought of one of those weather reporters' pointers? It, it's tempting, but so far, no. Uh, and actually, yeah, Germany's guilty of not investing in infrastructure prior to World War II. The Germans don't invest in infrastructure, full stop. For a nation which is constantly put up there as going, this nation's really good in terms of their science and engineering. You sit there and go, they did the Kiel Canal and basically stopped that. Can do 20 knots? I thought it was designed for no more than 20 knots. And we all know how designers can make mistakes. Yes, pretty much. You must remember, they are designed for no more than 20 knots. It's like the Britain class are... 18.75 <clears throat> knots is their maximum speed, we promise. We promise. Mm-hmm. That's lucky times, Wayne. Well, good luck. Hope your new laptop's good. Hope you enjoy it. That's good. How much do you think the 1800s Indian Mutiny influenced the lack of investment in the Indian Navy? Um, honestly, considering the sheer amount of investment they still put in up until about the 1850s and 1860s, and actually kept going until, honestly, the 1880s, the shipyard is still being invested in. The teak shipyard is very, very good. And you must remember, there are different parts of India. Some parts rebel, some parts are very loyal. And the parts which are loyal, they continue to invest in. Honestly, the parts which are still, to an extent, depressed in some respects today, economically, are the parts which since then were not invested in.
That sounds worrying, Stafford. Dr. Fact, wouldn't India and Singapore be the main producers of the Black Swan class soups then? Probably. If Singapore wouldn't produce pro any ships, probably, because they don't really have the facilities to. But you could, if you had built up, and this is the point in the 1920s and 30s, if you had got sloops being produced across the board in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, maybe South Africa, definitely India, as well as the UK, and they just, every year, they order another generation of sloops from all these yards, and all those navies basically combine, you would have hey, had a large group of roughly 1,200-ton warships that were designed for oceanic um, escort duties, minesweeping duties, um, oceanography, all those duties to, uh, to for, the native, for fighting World War II. But also, you would have had yards which were capable of building destroyers, and you would have had a capability which could have supported more. And it's going to sound strange. If you're building from scratch... <coughs> To jump to here is a far bigger jump if you're building up a infrastructure and yard structure from zero to jump to here. If your yard structure is here, that's a far smaller distance. And you've already got a basis, a foundation of all these things already that you can build from. So you want to do a crash water uh, building program in 1939 for destroyer, 38 or 39 for destroyers. You can do it. You could order hunt class at every single one of those nations. You want to build regular destroyers? You could do it. You won't even want to do a crash building building force of light cruisers. You can probably do that in all those yards if they've been building sloops on a regular basis through the 1920s and 30s. And if you cut them up. And you don't need to keep many yards going. I mean, this is a couple of yards in all these countries. They could be building four each a year. You know, two in each yard. And that could keep them going. And you sit down and go, well, that's not the amount of money. Well, let's put it as, let's do the maths. Let's say they start in 1922, building four in each of these yards. And they're building it in all four, all five of those countries. That's 20 a year. Let's say they build eight in the UK. So they're building 28 a year. Okay. 1924, 1922, they, they have 28. 1923, they now have 56 built, and it carries on. And once you get to 1939, which is 15 years later, well, you could have a total of 420 of those ships built. Or alternatively, you've got roughly the latest 280 in uh, built, uh, still in service, and you've the other 140 you've sold on to be, uh, to be trawlers, merchant vessels, all sorts of other things. They're mostly probably probably about fifty percent are run by reservists or more are run by res are actually reservist crews rather than regular crews, and they're probably fine. They've probably been refitted, upgraded, and if they're a little less than ten years old and they're twelve hundred tons, they're more than fine for doing these uh, these sort of operations, these uh, these escorting convoys or providing extra uh, ships for guarding areas, and they're going to free up your destroyers etc for doing the actual operations you need them for. Because, again, if you have 280 of these escorts, let's say you form them into groups which are roughly, I don't know, eight strong escort groups. Well, by my count, and I could be wrong, but by my count, you would then have 35 escort groups to escorting convoys. Which roughly means you could probably, under wartime conditions, be escorting... 17 convoys anywhere in the world at any time with the 17 other groups doing other things including maintenance and refit that would be pretty darn useful you think about it in world war ii if you start off and go oh yeah world war ii started we've got 17 we've got 35 escort groups ready to go straight away boom Okay, so now convoys were go uh, wolf pack. We're going. We the you know, Germans only have what 60, uh, 60 subs at the beginning of World War Two. They go right then. We're going to get twenty out, and we'll be attacking a wolf pack of four or five. Well, instead of there being three or four escorts, every convoy could have eight escorts, and maybe mate of these sloops and four or so destroyers sitting there. 
and suddenly you've got pairs of ships, a uh, pair of escorts hunting each submarine. Ooh, that's going to make a difference to their survivability. And if you, again, it all factors in. And this is all a long term thinking because these ships are cheap, they are not sexy. They are not that expensive, but they are going to require you actually investing a bit more money. And it's the same when we look at Malta. Malta is heavily invested in all these ship their dry docks, all these facilities are massively important. And yet, the whole time we have going through the interwar era, period, especially in the 1930s, there is basically a realization that any war with I I I any war with Italy will mean that Malta will get absolutely deluged in fire. And will absolutely be under enormous pressure from the Italian mainland. And yes, you can say, well, then avoid war with in with Italy, and you might not be war in Italy, so we why we should continue investing there. But mainly they continue investing there because they've got a tradition of investing there, and so they've got the dry docks, they've got the facilities, they invest in them. But it's actually one of the worst places to be investing in. And what about the floating dry docks like those in Singapore? Well, Singapore didn't just have floating ones. They had, of course, a fixed one. So they had both to support them out. Um, I too, more ships built in India and Australia could have incentivized the iron to tropic-proof their gear more. Working pom-poms with tracers alone could have made the zero difference to, for, for 4C. Now they would have. Now they would have. They, most of them worked, but it depends on which ship you're talking about. Repulse's ones seem to work better than Prince of Wales's. Those got the Germans built a pretty good railway network. Mm, yes and no. They've basically upgraded a pretty good railway network and rebuilt a, ra a, ra a fairly good railway network. But the railway network, a large chunk of it, was actually built before the Kiel Canal. Seneca Nero. Iron speed settings. Slow. Half. Cruising. Full. Flank. Max. Ludicrous. Ludicrous is going to wear out your engines quite quickly, but you'll do it. Did HMS Austell Bay, hello Carl, uh, visit Antarctica? Hmm. <laughs> She spent a lot of time as the Falklands guard ship. Um, so she could well have done a visit down there. I'm not sure of it specifically, but she did spend a lot of time from my... And if people don't know, there are some very, there's a very nice website you can go to which tends to have the list of what ships were doing on what days, and it doesn't quite have that. It has a down bow in that period as being on her duties as... Falklands guard ship. So yeah. Good well then. Um, no, Conley Hammer with an increase. And thank you for the super chat. With an increase in shipbuilding across the empire, and explosion, uh, expression of yards and facilities, you could see an increase in the piece of, in the pace of technological change. I.e., four and a half inch mount designed in India. It wouldn't necessarily be designed in India, but they might well, with the amount, a sheer amount of um, sloops being built, 
they could well have had far and more increased pressure to build a four and a half inch mount because that's a far better weapon for a sloop than a 4.7 is and it's a good meeting point for sloops and destroyers so they could well have been more incentivized to work on those things and it could well have been in service but that's jumping on the second and third order effects Hmm. MacBook Air M2. Hmm, good luck. My aunt likes Macs. I don't because I can't rip them apart. These ones I'm uh, I'm qualified to rip apart thanks to my years as an IT technician when I was doing my bachelor's, and I've kept the certificates mostly going. I too, you could have the older sloops performing utility roles and odd jobs, which would allow you to easily return them to armed service. Yes, they could well be off doing things like coast guarding duty. They could be off doing, I don't know, um, lighthouse duty. You always need ships to support the lighthouse and uh, uh, and the various societies which look after look after things like um, boys. That's B O U Y S. Now, why are forklifts important? Because especially if you... Well, forklifts matter more in a world where you are deploying... Are you relying on palleted infrastructure? If you're not relying on palleted infrastructure, then forklifts are less important. But that means you're probably relying on a less efficient form of infrastructure and logistical movement. But we'll leave that to one side. I too, and if you are to be building sloops like they are all uh, like that, they are also far more attractive for civilian orders, cargo ships, which likely means you have a breakout capability for mass building CVEs. Yes, again, because a small constant throw throughput of sloops will mean that those yards will have experience, have reputations, etc., and will be able to be competitive and bid for those things, which will create more employment. And that tends to, again, targeted investment can create a lot of a lot of benefit for governments. Targeted investment. I know they had a history of standing by water, but they had to realise at the time they were taking too much in terms of men and equipment to hold it before the war. It was certainly interesting. Come on, I'm asking for work. We believe we have an egg brought back by her, so I wouldn't be surprised. You can rip Macs apart too. Yes, but then it invalidates warranty, whereas I can rip things which aren't Mac apart and not invalidate the warranty. I'll send you the web, the web details. If the RN had more yards available in the colonies, how tempting to the Amrity would have been to send their 48,000 ton battle cruiser and oversee the yard for three years to fix her? I don't think there would have been any yard built up that would have actually had the facility to fix her. Um, a 48,000 ton battle cruiser, if they had one, and you must remember, in technical standard tonnage, not 48,000 tons. Um, but then we're not talking about yards which are big enough to fix capital ships or fleet carriers, they're not that size yards. It might mean that if you have an issue with a light cruiser or even a, like an 8-inch cruiser or a 6-inch cruiser, you can, well, you can already do some repair facilities in the local area anyway, especially Singapore, etc. But with actual shipyards you could, in nearby, you could do major repairs far locally. So you could do, you could have far better operations for your fleet in terms of that perspective. But don't expect your capital ships to be repaired by them. They would need investment for that. Wait, it's legal for them to invalidate a warranty because you worked on the device you own over there? Yep. Uh, 
I guessed you were talking about Hood 96831. But the most she ever does is go to Singapore because they can actually do some... Uh, not Singapore, to Malta. Because they can actually support her there. Now, one of the interesting things about South Africa is, of course, Simontown, uh, Simontown has this huge base. But this is nothing compared to the base which was originally planned. Again, South Africa is at a nexus point. Get away. South Africa, though, barely has a navy in either of the wars. They invest in it a bit, but honestly, they needed more. And one of the interesting things I often point out to people is, if you think about the Graf's Bay, that goes up and down the South African coast, very fairly close to get between the South Atlantic and the Indian Ocean. If South African Navy had their own uh, war existence and had their own sloops and had been building their own sloops in that period, no sloops would not have a chance of fighting the Graf's Bay. But if the Graf's Bay engaged one of those sloops, it would get off a radio signal and it would message where their location was. And yeah, they might not damage it, but the location is almost as bad because if you consider where the other ships are, let's say the South Africans also had a flotilla of destroyers nearby. Their own flotilla of tribal class destroyers. Ouch! You killed a sloop. Yes, but it's radioed its position. And, oh good lord. Or even worse for a surface radar, you suddenly have all these sloops built. You have this investment in infrastructure. You have those yards, those capabilities in South Africa, which has grown it, which has grown their industry and grown their capability. What does that mean? Well, it means that British ships can be maintained there, which is good for them, especially if you consider some of the things with foreknowledge of what happens in World War II, but also the global reality of the fleet operating. But, um, yeah, you suddenly no longer have solo ships operating in the South Atlantic or around the Cape of Good Hope and those areas because you have enough convoy, you have enough sloops to do convoy escort. So, yeah, there is convoys going on. Yes, you have firepower, but they have all these sloops there. They probably have, as they have eight sloops protecting it, they probably have two or three destroyers with their torpedoes. And the thing is, yes, you can probably kill them, but you're probably going to take damage killing them. This is the sort of thing that if you've done some sensible invest invest investment, and especially post-World War I, where you'd have seen the problems imposed on your fleet by surface raiders and, i.e. the end them, etc., and submarines, such investment should have been a basic understanding of any British government and any Britain, the British Empire. We have to make it so that surface raiders and subsurface raiders cannot cannot interfere in our operations. And the best way to do that, the moment in treaties you have it declared that these escort, these kind of convoy escorts sloops, as you would call them, the French call them chamsels, chamsel, chamsel. Uh, various nations have different terminologies for them. As soon as you... You can have as many of them as you like. Build them. And build lots of them. Across the empire. Technically, a warranty is invalidated if a non certificated water a technician works on the unit. Mm -hmm. I too, even if in the overseas you can't fix large battle crews of battleship, if you can fix ones which would free up uh, 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 would free up resources from other yards, increase industry could also reduce stuff like bottlenecks on your own plate. Yes.
No harm off topic, but retarget investment. I've seen the talk that our own subs would go to Milford Haven, a waterway, if Scotland left. Now, how feasible that? Given it's seen little investment, would it be likely? Not really. Um, plus, Milford Haven is awfully close to a oil and gas terminal, if I remember correctly, and they tend to not want to locate those things, etc., because submarines going in and out, you don't, they, when they're, especially when they're transitioning, in depths, you don't want them anywhere near large things which they can hit. That's one of the reasons why Faz Lane is quite good. But there are spaces they would look into. Probably it's a debatable as to where it would be, but maybe you'd be talking about Cornwall. Milford Haven is a bit... Mm, there are issues. It would require a lot of investment to get them up to it. Uh, short term, it would probably be Plymouth, because they have the other nuclear certified port. Memory. Where it goes long term is a different matter. If they needed to do immediate, you know, transfer. Would more shipyards in the Far East mean more raids for Z special units in their snake class junks up further into Indonesia, possibly Burma and Indochina? Um... Was he special unit? Uh, potentially, but also potentially would also mean there's far more vessels around to go. Hello, what are you? We've got four and a half inch guns. Stop being annoying. I think yeah, if Canada had got those free Queen Elizabeths, then they'd have had the infrastructure to support the Roman engines. If they got free Queen Elizabeths, they'd have to build a whole massive amount of infrastructure. When a uh, lot of science and technology, a flotilla of tribals against Deutschland would result in a very sad Deutschland. It would certainly result in something painful. The advantage of Cornwall is the background radiation present means no one will notice the occasional leak. Hmm, it's fun times. <laughs> uh, yeah, I ate recently, I think. Actually, no. I did have some lunch, but I will get a snack out. I'll be good. Let's see, what have I got in here for a snack? Um, I have cheese. <clears throat> it's the advantage of having a fridge. I no longer need to have... How do I put this? A conversation with delivery drivers. I can just have it ready to go. Always eating during the stream. I realise there is a bingo going around on in terms of my what uh, in terms of my lives. Yeah, it's like when I'm presenting for three hours in front of a class. Often I will have some food and drink there because I'm a uni lecturer and my students are allowed food and drink in a class. I, nicest way. I do not understand the concept of it being free. Uh, Chris Hemsworth eats every 30 minutes, roughly. I like to eat every couple of hours or so. Excuse me a second, I'm closing the doors so that the flies can't come in.
baby. Ah, New Zealand. Now, New Zealand has a high point. They have their own battle cruiser, which they supply to the Royal Navy. They pay for. Well, hey, lovely. They then have a low point when you realise that after they've built the Calliope dock, they then stop investing in anything. They really do. At no point are you looking at New Zealand going, wow, you've built your own ships. They really don't build anything. It's quite absurd. Now, yes, they can point out their population density, and I agree. And... Certainly sustaining more than one yard would be very difficult. But they have got enough industry, enough infrastructure going on, they could sustain a yard, and actually it probably would help their economy if they had. Carmen, how many sleeps to kill Graf Spain? No, here's the point, as I mentioned when I was talking about the earlier thing. You'd have eight sloops, but you might have four, to, uh, four destroyers with them. Three, four destroyers. You might also have a light cruiser wandering along as well in that case. So if you have a C-class light cruiser, let's say. Four destroyers. Tri mm, let's not even say they're travel class. Let's say they're just generic fleet destroyers with those torpedo with eight torpedoes each and their own four and a half inch guns. And you've now got eight sloops. Yes, individually, any of those components. Graf Spey can probably win the fight. Can they win the fight against all 15 ships engaging them? Yeah. Got it. Hmm. Probably not. Because can you can't really tell a sloop which has twin gun a twin four and a half inch two twin four and a half inch guns forward versus from a destroyer which has two twin four and a half inch forward coming at you until one swivels and fires its torpedoes. I could all be spewing out smoke and all firing away. Pete Dawson, consider Battleship versus Tappy Free. Hmm. That Chris Hemsworth is also working out daily during portions of his filming and has to lift at least twice his body weight. I'm not even benching that much, man. Um, I try and get to the gym most days. I'm trying to work out my fitness. And to be honest, I'm back to benching. I went well, I hadn't benched at all during COVID. And I'm back to my weight and a half, which is roughly 100. At current, oh, my weight is going down, but I'm currently benching what is my current weight and a half, which is roughly 150 kilos. Leg press, or leg press, I'm up to 300, so that's doing good. Bench, taking longer. Fun course, I see female these everywhere. That would be another thing. Insect murder time, yes, always. <laughs> I guess it was a tongue cheek comment, but I also wanted to point out they they would be a problem for it. And also, there is other things, you know. They could all be spewing smoke. 
again, if you consider if you consider the Royal Navy training officers, I'm fairly certain at least one or two of them would think, well, hang on, if we lay enough smoke, we might be able to get close enough that we can drop depth charges in front of her. That would be fun. Imagine the Grass Bay running over depth charges. So yeah, the, the, this, the torpedoes might be one thing, but there also might be some sloop commanders going, Get me closer, I want to drop the depth charges! So, infrastructure around the world. There are absolutely humongous, mahusive gaps in this. Most of those are territories which they don't have any relations with. But let's be honest, there's one here in Australia. Have you noticed that there's Darwin, Townsville, Sydney... Where's mentioned in terms of Western Australia? Hmm? We have Trincomalee, Ceylon, Bombay. Durban, Simonstown. Falklands, you know. There are huge gaps in this. Yes, the Royal Navy has a massive advantage. They have all these hubs which they can do various things of infrastructure. Various pits of support in. Some of these bases, like the Falkland Islands, are for self-maintenance only. They are not. They don't really have any facilities there to support you. Some of them have actually quite large facilities to support you and provide maintenance. They do. Sorry, distracted by a mosquito, which is mm. where are you off to? I'm gone off that way now. Okay. So you can have all these things, but you need to have the infrastructure to support them. You cannot have a fleet without infrastructure. What is really worrying about this infrastructure is the vast majority of it was actually invested in a long time before the period you would actually think it was necessary. This is mostly the flower of the 1850s and the early 18 and the 1890s, even World War One era, when you think that the British are concentrating on fighting a war versus Germany, where that is their prima facie enemy. And yet they're investing in global infrastructure. Because their enemies also at this point is Russia and various other powers, which they might end up fighting a war alongside. But, you know, let's be honest, that's just an interlude between the real and the real war. This is what we have going on. And this is all long-term investment, because... Think about this. Building the yards in Halifax and the facilities in Halifax. How much use are they in World War I? Submarines can't get that far out in the Atlantic, so there's nothing really going on there much. But they're incredibly useful come World War II. A lot of this stuff is built in periods when... You no, don't know when you're going to need it or when it's going to be useful. That one's dead. But you still build it. Because it'll be useful someday and it helps the local economy. And as a, if it helps the local economy, it helps your economy. This is something which is forgotten a lot in the modern world, but also in this period. That if you're a colonial power, you make money off colonies, off your empire, by being able to do two things. One, extract money through taxes, and two, sell them goods. 
They will buy more if they have more infrastructure to, uh, that raises their level of demand. They will produce more money if they have more infrastructure because they'll have more commercial activity themselves. The more commercial activity will allow them to buy more as well. It's all good. If you think it through it properly and you actually exercise some proper long-term thinking, which seems to be a problem for many, many people. Many signal. Gee, which had a large explosive charge? Torpedoes or depth charges? Either way, I suspect such a thing going off below a ship would be detrimental to the ship's integrity. And also remember just how many depth charges could be launched. It might be suicidal for the sloop, but how many sloop commanders would not care about that being suicidal? <laughs> uh. That's good. In our t in Rome Total War 2, if you want to start a war, building infrastructure in somebody's backyard is a good way to go about it. Hmm. Most of well, science technology, New Zealand still has issues. They send their ships to Canada for upgrade and maintenance. Yeah, that's not exactly unusual for the Antipodeans. Lions, you could always design and try, always try and design suits the ability to fit a torpedo launch as if war came out was maybe a single triple. It. What are you saying? That we have a space on deck which allows them to have a swivel torpedo fitted there? Maybe it could be a space which in peacetime has a swivel crane and extra boat storage because, you know, they need boats of things. It's just a terrible idea. Where do you think of these things? Please, do not go and look up some of the designs of the Black Swan and Bittens and where exactly some of the cranes were being looked at. Are you suggesting putting a tribal commander on the sloop does a dangerous idea? I'm suggesting that the destroyers and the sloops in the Royal Navy, the uh, small forces, a uh, small ship commanders came from pretty much the same cloth. And that quite a lot of sloop commanders tended to be the anti submarine warfare specialists and tended to go on to other things, but they would also end up in destroyers. And, well, some of the destroyer commanders from World War II started out as, had started out as sloop commanders. They tend to have a good crossover. Lynn Cox, mosquitoes is why we Scots grow more body hair. Hmm. Ah, rule the waves too. No, uh, not Rome Total War 2. Uh, two. Hmm. Dang, uh, if we develop the British Virgin Islands, the Yanks would start getting paranoid. Yeah, but it would be fun, wouldn't it? Really wind them up. I would argue again that the US infrastructure issues are what's, uh, what's really underpinning them. One of the things that you often see is there's all this discussion of a 500 ship or a 375 ship navy and all these things, and currently we don't have any discussion of the thing they should be discussing, which is where are we going to build those? You know, it's like every time I see someone go, well, Australia will have to buy American subs, and I'm going, well, the American shipyards are maxed out producing American subs, so that's not going to happen anytime soon. Even the British shipyard, it's maxed out personnel-wise. It's not maxed out space-wise, but it's maxed out personnel-wise, so it would actually have to hire more personnel. 
Now, that could be a good thing because there could be a good levy of Australians amongst them, which could help train up their own skills to build ships. They could build a couple of boats in the UK and then transfer over to building in Australia, building those boats in Australia. But it's going to be expensive. So it's got design sloop for not with a single spinal tube on the water for twenty <laughs> on the water for twenty four inch torpedo tube. Not really. It's going to be a deck mounted swivel system. Even a deeper explosion is still going to create a void in the water below the ship. That's not good for the keel remaining in a single piece. No, it could well break the back of your uh, your lovely surface radar, which might stop its progress anywhere else. I oh, so Bermuda can't have a dry dock because it would upset the US. I basically say to the Americans, it's none of your business. Yeah, we didn't want to start a war, and it was far easier to have a very nice dry dock, uh, a very nice um, floating dry dock. There are advantages to having a floating dry dock base there. It does. Um, how do I put this? Floating dry docks, if they are well maintained and well positioned, tend to be fairly survivable assets. Remember, they're things which are actually designed to sink. Wayne's World talking about small ship command requires a peculiar mindset. It does in wartime. It requires a certain level of aggression, which is almost obscene. Andrew Paul, um, not really, because uh, wouldn't it have been better for idea for Australia to actually get a replacement cons class with AIP while starting nuclear work for nuclear subs? Well, yes, but the trouble is they'd have to build something from scratch. You know, the big problem for the French was they were basically trying to promise a diesel sub in a small nuclear submarine's hull with nuclear submarine level of operational capability because... If you look at the Collins class, they have to be very long-legged. And that's the trouble. The, so the Australians, when the Collins class were built, there were a fair number of nations pushing for long-range SSKs. Now, if you want long-range boats, you either go, SS, you go SSN or you don't. And that's the trouble for the Australians. The, the Australians have, fall, have fallen into that trap. And they have the makings of a nuclear industry. They're one of the biggest uranium suppliers in the world. They just don't have their own reactors. So they're going to take uh, infrastructure and a lot of time to work things up. But no, there's no real option out there for them to go with an AIP interim. Also, they'd have honestly their best bet that's on their timing if they wanted in such a vessel would probably have been had to go with the Japanese. But for various reasons, including the Japanese willing un uh, the Let's put it this way. The French claimed they were very willing to transfer technology and do construction outside of France. The Japanese were slightly more honest about it. And it looks like it that the Japanese were about on the money of what they were rating, actually, what the level of support Australia had to build it was. That's where also I think the issue is going to come with nuclear submarines for Australia, but that's off topic. Come, the remote come. No, cost should be no object or so long as it works and it's effective and maintainable. Yes and no. Uh, something here. I once had enough. Uh, heard America's concept of enough submarines described as similar to an orc's concept of enough Dakar. Uh, not quite. Not quite. Otherwise, they'd have a lot more sea walls than they'd probably still gone on to Virginia's. But you'd have thought they'd have built. I don't know. Six to twelve 
Seawolves then shifted to Virginia's not gone free. That's enough. Kind of like they did with the Zumwalt's. And now they're having all sorts of funds because they're insisting on designing a new hull that's going to take the Arleigh Burke latest Arleigh Burke software sensors and weapons and the Zumwalt power supply. And you sit there and go... Why are you designing a new hull as well when you have the power plant and you have a hull already working and available and you know it's good? Why build that much risk into it? Well, actually, wasn't there, there somebody trying to build torpedoes that would detonate underneath from the contact? Pretty much everyone who's trying to de develop a magnetic torpedo, the British one was actually supposed to go underneath and detonate at the magnetic, uh, this magnetically strongest point, which is when they're directly underneath the ship. Um, glowworm, no, sorry, glowworm had depth charges. What if instead of ramming, she'd pass alongside, basically scraping paint while rolling charges, set quite shallow? It would have been interesting if they if they're rolling off it depends how you're rolling them 50 feet to port no but if they're just they're just toward on side you could actually theoretically capsize the hipper you'd probably take yourself down with it but you know uh Citroen 90 i think if singapore had not been traded to Bren penang would have taken its role i doubt it i think they'd have probably done something nasty to get Singapore because Singapore is what you need for those straits. I tell you, the Germans had nothing to knock UK dry docks right. They tended to try for them occasionally, but they never did the full all-out efforts that the British did to deal with dry docks. Um, I, Safadon, I don't think they're going to be getting any of those bases back in a few years' time from then lease. I, I, I think it's past that point. That's good. The problem the French had is when it came to demonstrate the technology required for the subs, they couldn't. It's very difficult to square that particular triangle, let alone the circle. So where was Baden? I, I don't think it was Baden which caused the British want the High Seas Fleet destroyed. The British would prefer the High Seas Fleet didn't exist because if it's divided amongst the Americans, French, Italians, and all the other powers, it would A, boost up their strengths, and B, give them access to all the technologies the Germans developed, and C, would cause the British to have to worry about those numbers. Canada has the same issue, which is why British subs have worked. That's why our next class will probably be nuclear. We need to be able to cover every ocean. Yes, but trying to explain to Canada they need nuclear submarines next is going to be an interesting debate to have. I have a feeling my sensibility of it is that it's SSNR is probably going to turn into an Anglo-Australian project. And maybe Canada decides to join in it. Maybe. That would be certainly be the sensible route.
Chang Chang, Dutch Clark, why did the new DD class risk? Because the Zumwalt holder opens the possibility of working 155 on rare guns to compete with CVs in the strike roll. Any hull offers that potential risk. But um, honestly, the rail guns, it's the power system which is the risk for that, because they could support that. And the working 155, well, you could get a working 155 without any trouble if they actually bothered to put some effort into it. Honestly, the Americans have a working 203 if they want to go back to it. Sorry to copy my question, but what about the change from calling stations to oiling stations? Big change, wasn't it? It was a big change and less of a change. It meant you could have the infrastructure further apart. You didn't need as many coal stations, but mostly the coal stations, they converted the major coal stations to oil stations. And also, you have to remember, there were still a lot of coal-fired ships, especially merchant vessels, around in this period. So those stopping ports were still stopping ports. Seriously, how comes past that point? You wanted the Hong Kong Hanover. Why won't you get your bases back from the States? Um, the ones which the state still owns, maybe. Maybe not. Maybe. Maybe not. The ones which the state doesn't own, which they've handed over to local governments, probably not. I too. Newport News is awfully far if you have a breakdown in the Caribbean, and cheap free maintenance or repairs is still attractive for auxiliaries which have no class stuff on board. Hmm, that's true. I don't know. So I was reading earlier about the high sea. If the high seas fleet hadn't scuttled, ironically, the Germans didn't don't seem to realise that by scuttling the ships, uh, when it, uh, they're scuttling ships, when in reality is they are only aiding the British. That's how the British like to roll. Hmm. I mean, think about a bayonet, a bayonet at Sparta Vento would be a very different fight. It would be a very interesting fight, a bayonet at Sparta Vento. Um, it would certainly be an issue. But again, there's also what do the British do? Because in the nicest way, if you divide up the high seas fleet, there's no way in Hootenanny the British do not build their next generation of of um, dreadnoughts. So you might well be in talking world where yes, Spadavento, the Italians have a Baden, but the British might have a couple of G3s. In which case, mm, the ban might not matter so much as what's happening to the uh, what's happening to the Italians. So anyway, what would happen if Singapore are paying Dutch? Britain would find a way of making sure it didn't remain Dutch. Scott, no, the Royal Navy did make an effort to stop them scuttling the ships. There was actually a firefight over it. A very minor one, but there was a firefight over it. That's right, Oscar. If Poland had an additional $30 billion, we would have bought three SSNs and two carriers, similar size to Charles of Gaulle, with escorts, three carriers, and some, and some funds left over. Nah. Sorry, if Poland had that much money, they might buy some SSNs, probably more SSKs, and they probably wouldn't be buying carriers because, in the nicest way, you've got Russia right next door to you. Uh, they would be uh, by. They would be investing in more artillery and tanks and APCs, and probably rebuilding the infrastructure so their vehicles would have an easier time moving from west to east than from east to west.
Next one. Looks like 30 feet was an available pistol setting for the Mark 9 DC, and 20 knots was the minimum safe speed for rolling them off. Set for, uh, to the death. Was thinking heading straight for her and ahead at 20 knots. Scream paint and surprise. Hmm. Might be interesting. Lannons. Using the Zumwalt hull for a different purpose would be logical these days. It would be the sensible route to go rather than developing a whole new hull type. Squad. Melanie 64, is that before or after the armor on board? Had a look at the fuses. Well, you know, that depends on the quality of your armor. And your chief petty officer who's a, who's wandering around as well. That's good. Was it an actual firefight or going for the motion of the same face firefight? I'm not sure what that's talking about. Oh, we're talking about the um, the Scarpa Throat. People actually died, so I think it's more than a saving face firefight, but it's not much more. Uh, Carmen, maybe Poland could use a small fleet of high end and high end general purpose destroyers. Probably, those would be quite useful assets. Both for sitting in the Baltic and providing a lot of fire support, but also, more importantly, going off and joining task groups with carriers in other forces and helping allies. They'd be something useful to send to allies. Nigerian, old history. Hood gets stuck in the Panama Canal during the Empire Cruise. How do they get her out, and what is the fallout? Uh, a lot of high explosive and a lot of careful manoeuvring with the tugboat. And probably a big one. A massive loss of face for the Royal Navy. Well, so, let's see. Might be a follow-up to a video to your treaty videos. What with what happens to the naval treaties if the High Seas Fleet having parcelled it out amongst the victors? Uh, if the High Seas Fleet is parcelled out, then the Royal Navy will want to build more of their 16-inch ships. And they will probably be looking for uh, bigger ships as well, because they'll be going in the nicest way, we're not going to accept this. So you probably get a bigger overall allowance, and you get bigger ships, and the Royal Navy will probably be allowed to build three to four new ships rather than just two. Probably they'd have to spread it out and build no more than two in any two-year period. So it'd have to be over four years they'd build them. You're right about tanks, too. I mean, the carriers are needed to attack from the east. Why do that if you're Poland? You've got America to go do that if anyone wants to. And if you're attacking from the other end of Russia, don't expect... It's not exactly going to draw off Russian forces, because in the nicest way, there is not much movement of Russian forces from east to west or west to east. It's just too massive. You want to stop that off, you can just drop a bomb at anywhere on... Or just send a special operations team, actually, probably easier. Um, and just or even a couple of blokes with a pickup truck, to just start damaging rail lines. Honestly, it's too big to secure. You can't really do anything about it. You could turn up and, with a jackhammer, get rid of most of that railway line. Hi, Sean. Just back from a successful new job interview and had a thought. Let's see. You mentioned in the past countries made contingency plans of fighting everyone. A la US versus UK. Is this still true? Ye yes, but it's not discussed that often. But yes, they'll have plans. They'll be worked on somewhere in deep and dark by various quiet professionals. Um, where can I find information on who was supposed to be get what from what in the, from the Asia uh, Sea Fleet? Uh, there are various discussions going on in the Treaty of Versailles. So, newspapers and broadcasts around that time are fairly quite good. (laughs) 
Uh, George Newman, I think your office chair is trying to tell you that you need a new chair, or you need to look take care of it better. So for some if the RCN had kept its carrier force up until the redesign of the 90s, what would the task group attached to the Falklands look like? I'm not sure if the RCN would have sent a top Falklands task group, so a, a carrier group down to Falklands. But I think they probably would have moved a carrier group to help protect, fill in for NATO role for Britain. So probably you'd have had a Canadian carrier group operating off Norway or something for the first period. Hmm, it happens. Right then. I was up until um, about 4am UK time this morning, and I had to wake up to deal with a delivery at about 7am. So, uh, I am going to say if we are sort of seem to be finishing questions, last questions, and then I'm going to finish this. Okay? Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Thank you for your support, as ever. Please go look at the shop down below, the sort of banner and the clinks, because it's um, mainly it's just nice to have people looking at it, because I've put some effort into some of the designs, and some of them have got no attention at all. So it's purely for my ego I'd like people to go look at them. CJ19, of the colonies that are on your list, how many of them could Britain afford to maintain today if all chose to remain in the British post-war? Well, if depends what form of colony they've main, maintained as. If they be maintained as a colony colony, that could be interesting. Still possible, but it's going to affect your budgets. If you've made them into a kind of federated global UK, United Kingdom, so you call it the United Kingdom, you maybe call it the United Commonwealth or something like that, or the British Com United British Commonwealth or something like that. Um, and brought them together as some sort of federated name, then that would be a global spanning democracy, but also would be a global spanning economy, and it could probably sustain. It would have to be have a larger navy than it currently does, but it would be able to sustain it. Um, there are some books. I think, um, ooh, do, do, do. Dreadnought, Robert K. Massey, which I have up above my head here, um, does have a section in it, which is all about that. So that will also have a section in for, I think, to answer your question, that's the character on, uh, on the high seas fleet. Um, Daratowski, the British would have scuttled the fleet in Scapa and blamed the Germans anyway. Not really. They wouldn't have done something so obvious as that. They might have put made them all so that they had engine issues. Thank you, Trent. Thank you, IO2. I wonder what the RCN would fly in that scenario. Mm, Buccaneer or something, I, I think. Maybe Sea Harriers. Depends on the... If they're still going operating the same carrier, maybe Sea Harriers. They've done a conversion like Hermes. In the lock line of fire. Didn't the Kiwis send ships to help out in the Far East while the Falcons were kicking off? Yes. Nice everyone. Why was the Ottoman fleet not divided up? It was terrible. Plus, Turkey was Turkey. By that point, not the Ottoman Empire. Things had evolved. No one wants to jump into that mess. They're already trying to deal with the mess that was Russia at this point. Technically, it was up recording videos. Take care, Ronan. Take care, Sean. So anyway, where can I find a good book on Canic Glass Destroy uh, DDGs, or should I wait for you to write one? Um, there is a Norman Freeman's got a good section in his book. There's a couple of others which are interesting. They have good parts. 
Uh, the British weren't, weren't interested in any taking any part of the High Seas Fleet. They really weren't that keen on it. And most of the uh, victors didn't want the British to get it because if the, that would just make the world's largest fleet even more powerful, was their theory. And they were more interested in leveling up than they were in um, equality, eh, eh, equality of distribution. You can do all sorts of things, Derp Squad. All sorts of things. Fine. Take care, Anna and Paul. Take care, Calvin and Gusbert. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much for your support, and take care. Thank you, everyone. All. And um, just to give you an idea while I do this. We have one of the bo uh, one of the sh uh, blocks of sh uh, bo uh, shells. This is sort of one of the bookshelves, and down there we have another set of bookshelves. So that's what's going in, and I've still got to put in the last one. So take care, everyone. Thank you. Have fun. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Stafford. Thank you, Dirt Squad. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Editor Paul. Carmen Gasberg. Uh, thank you, 96831. Thank you, John Sykes. Thank you, VG40. Thank you, IO2. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roland Cash. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Roland, be, uh, be, uh, be nice to Mrs. Cash. Look after her. She's had a tough train journey from sounds of things. Uh, take care, Paul Imus. Thank you. I think I said thank you, IO2, but it just because I haven't. Thank you. And then 35 members. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Take care. And Tanith Bellicure, thank you. Hello, Captain Seafort, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Take care.